Hey, Tom. Hey. Hey, what's up? Can you see and hear me? I can. Perfect. I'm so happy that we made it. Thanks for having me, dude. Yes. So we are, um, you, you only see me, but we, I'm standing in a lecture hall with roughly 50 students uh, here from the Berlin University of the Arts and another, I don't know, 25 um, watching us online. It, uh, it was actually quite fun because we had to uh, postpone a little bit because we had a timing issue um, from before. And today, another context, today is the last session of the semester and it's basically semester break, summer break. And I brought a couple of crates of beer for after our talk. But um, since we had to wait, we had the beer now. <laughs> so there's a good mood in the room, yeah? So the yeah, beer has already been finished and, and now uh, Tom is coming up. But uh, how are you? I'm great. I hope that I would encourage you to keep drinking beer. <laughs> yes. Schweizer müssen Bier trinken. So um, we are reaching you now in New York, is that correct? Yes. So what have you been up to? We know that you were in a call with the creative director of Nike. That's how much we already have uh, uh, been informed. Um, yeah, we one of our, our writers um, we were meeting with um, for working on um, some communications involving Nike Craft, which is our brand. Yes. It promotes sort of, or I should say that supports the values of the studio. Um, for those who are interested, it's not what an artist can do for Nike, it's what Nike can do for us. Yeah. So, um, you know, they make our uniforms and together we are Nike Craft. Um, and I'm pretty proud of what we've been able to do about communicating values of transparency and um, rocking a stain. Sweet. I will, I will come back actually to this whole kind of combination of uh, art world and design world that um, you represent as well. But I'm curious, um, it's a general question, kind of what books are currently on your table? What books are on your table next to the bed or in the studio? Well, the book I'm, that I'm in the middle of now is uh, Daniel Pinchbeck's Breaking Open the Head which is a study of uh, contemporary shamanism. Um, it's, a his it's a history of how um, people have used um, other dimensions of reality to expand their consciousness and have greater connection with the earth. Well, beautiful. And this is leading to another project for you or pure personal interest? Sorry? Pure personal interest, or is this leading to another project? Well, it's all integrated. Um, I, I think one of the great things that we're learning, um, maybe through Web3, is um, that there are many dimensions to reality, and that um, we can use, there are all kinds of tools that we have at our disposal to access those dimensions. Now, um, I'll like list four. So number one is our consensual reality, the one that we're in right now, which is kind of like money, right? We all agree that a euro is worth a euro and that way we can trade. You know, you've got a pizza and I want it, I'll give you some euro for it. Um, and if we don't all agree on that, the value of that euro, we can't, um, we can't transact. And the consensual reality, the reality that we're all in right now is that reality of that we're all here. But we all know that the metaverse is another reality like Grand Theft Auto or Decentraland or Mona. And then we also know that the internet is another reality because we experience important things there. Like the reality of your Instagram is so different than your real life, but it's, but it's real because we transact and the things that are important happen there. There are other realities like um, the psychedelic reality, like when you're on LSD and you can see things that you can't normally see um, and you can see the world through a different perspective. And then when you come down off the trip, 
you remember and you and you and you're forever marked with the understanding that there are many ways of looking at the same thing uh, and that the drug helps us uh, have like a window although temporarily into that dimension um the the, the reality that the sculpture exists in is we call that the plywood metaverse or a, a um uh, a, a plywood analog augmented reality and that's the area that we've been investigating for 30 years of the space program of the tea ceremony we make the world not the way it is but the way we want it to be and through making sculptures with an extreme degree of detail that support our own uh, rituals of our live demonstration. Some people might call it performance art. We don't use that word. It's kind of a dirty word. If you say performance art in the studio, you have to put a euro in the swear jar. But um, it's pretty much technically the same thing. But we have our rules that we create that help us take our um, homemade rituals to a more serious level. And that's really no different than any other organized religion. I mean, maybe we're smaller. You know, there are 20 people in the studio, but today they include all of you. And if you think I'm full of shit, you are, are of course within your right to get up and leave. And I would encourage you to leave. But your presence indicates that you're at least interested enough, hopefully with some skepticism to um, hear what I'm saying and maybe challenge me with questions later when that is appropriate in this conversation. To understand that we are committed to building this plywood metaverse. We're committed to creating this reality. And I think that all artists do that. I don't think that we're unique. I mean, we're unique in that we make the best Tom Sachs work that there is to make. But there are many artists, and every artist has their own set of rules or guidelines or inspirations or consistent gestures that help them make their work. And further to that, um, the important thing is the, um, and because I know that there are there, is it, are there artists in the audience tonight? Well, it's a it's a whole class field of becoming artists, architects, fashion designers, musicians, actors. It's a very like trans and interdisciplinary mix of the Berlin University of the Arts and many also exchange students. Okay, so I am speaking to a room of, of people who understand themselves as artists. And if you say that you're a student to become an artist, I hereby grant you permission and dub you artist. <laughs> yes. You are artist now. <laughs> so actually now that you... <laughs> and if you don't feel like an artist yet, like you still feel like a student or you still wait tables for a living, that's okay. You still do that. And you are an artist. So, but if you if you believe it, you know you've got my support. That's um, I think highly appreciated in the crowd. But Tom, how did it all start for you? Like, what Wait, do you I'm, what do you consider your first art piece? I'm not done with my rant. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the, the 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 preacher is <laughs> the preacher is still going. <laughs> um, um, and, and, and just the last thing I would say is the. What makes it, and it doesn't matter if you're a painter or artist, a photographer or a, or a fashion designer or a writer or a lawyer. Um, you, you're an artist because you say you are, and the art that you make is only a result of your routine, of your ritual, which is showing up. All you have to do is show up. The only ones that survive, the only ones that are successful are the ones that show up and do it every day. Huh. Um, because it's hard. And the ones who don't show up, the ones who aren't successful, are the ones who gave up because they're sane. Oof, powerful. Actually, this reminds me, um, in Staying with the Trouble by Donna Haraway, like one of the main things she says is like, you have to show up, but in every way, not only with your work, but also like you have to show up, you have to be around, um, you have to go to things, uh, you have to go to do your thing every day. 
but uh, yeah, so that's in the same line of things. So thank you uh, for this. Um, but now again, like, how did it start for you? Like, what do you consider your first art piece? Or when was that moment you said, I am an artist? Or did you have someone give you the blessing like you gave us today? Um, well, it's, it's kind of complicated, but I think the moment I was, someone once gave me kind of like that lecture that I just gave to you. And I remember thinking, yeah, 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 whatever, dude. Thanks for the lecture. Go fuck yourself. And then um, a couple months later, I was uh, at a job as a janitor and I was cleaning a toilet. And I realized in that moment that um, I just moved to New York. My first job was cleaning a toilet. And I just remembered in that moment, or I saw that although I was getting paid by the hour, that what, and I really, I didn't really have a huge, I didn't have a lot of agency over my actions because I was working for someone and they said, go clean the toilet. And I had to do that. And I was on a janitorial crew. And I realized in that moment that my art was making that toilet shine. And I had nothing else. If I wanted to do that job, which is just so I could get paid $10 an hour, I had, I could either like present the toilet cleaning. I could do it really fast and shitty. I could do it really thoroughly and make it shine. And once I had this realization that it didn't really matter what I was doing, uh, it, it, but it totally mattered what, I, how I was doing it. Um, my life opened up and I had a sense of agency. And I remember I was talking to my crew and they were like, the team, I was on a team of, I wasn't leading the crew. I was talking to other people that were on my toilet cleaning team. And they were like, they were coworkers. And they said, Tom, you're doing too good of a job and you're doing it too fast. You're making us all look bad. And I said, dudes, they were toilet cleaners. Let's just do the best toilet cleaning job we can. And they were like, no, fuck you. And I was like, fuck you. Um, you want to clean toilets your whole life? Like, drag it out and make it take as long as you want. Or get it done and let's do something else. Or be the best toilet cleaners ever. And sure enough, like, I was their manager in a few weeks. And then I graduated into other things, which I didn't want to be cleaning toilets my whole life. But I guess um, I made the most of it. And then later on, I saw a movie called Color It Clean. Please write it down. Color, Color it clean. It clean. And that's a movie that kind of outlines this philosophy. I hadn't seen it at the time, but we came to the same result. But there's almost like a Zen mode to that, no? I guess. I don't like those. I don't like it when like white middle aged guys from Connecticut talk about Zen. Um, unless it's to like seduce their, you know, uh, future second Asian wife or something. So I. But yeah, I think it is the same. But then, but then how would you, picking up on this one, how, how do you do what you do? Like what's your, uh, what is then your way of doing things? Is there like a, I don't know, is there like a methodology to it? Because you've already mentioned routines and rituals and you know, from our previous conversations and knowing your work, I think there's a lot of rituals in how you do things. There's a clear methodology. Is it? Yeah, I mean, I think it doesn't really, how do I say this? It doesn't really matter exactly what your ritual is. I mean, if you don't know what the ritual is that works for you, if you don't know what the, how you want to spend your life, your job is figuring that out. And you will figure that out only by doing lots of things and spending more time doing the things that you like to do or prioritizing them. And even if it means you got a job cleaning toilets, you know, wake up five minutes earlier and spend five minutes writing in your journal or doing something that you find rewarding and then work towards stretching that five minutes out into five hours so that you get paid to do it. And the only reason that works is because um, 
Well, like I said before, like you, you know, you, um, it's gonna, there are gonna be times when it gets hard. And my ritual is um, every day before I wake, before I look at my phone, because I'm an addict like everyone else, I draw in my notebook or I touch clay or I do output before input. Because sure as shit, like this thing that's filled with, you know, meetings like this one or email or Instagram or WhatsApp, text message, uh, Telegram, Instagram, DM, all those people reaching out to me wanting to sell me their vision. What I do is connect with my subconscious mind that I've been working with for the past eight hours while sleeping. So I prioritize sleep. Um, we can talk about that too. Mm. Um, by connecting with it and writing stuff down, that's like kind of my secret weapon. And I, I don't know. Um, like literally every, everyone that, picked up the key. pen and wrote it down. So, sorry, sorry? Tom, but what you said out first output, then input. I think almost everyone in the classroom here picked up the pen and wrote this down. So yes. Message received, but please continue. And, and if you if you want to geek out about it, go into my Instagram of about, I don't know, a year ago or a year and a half ago, we made a bunch of movies called um, uh, ISRU, in situ resource utilization. It was a class that we taught. And um, a lot of the things that I'm saying today come from that class. And one of the lessons was output before input. And could you do this every day for a month? for a year. It's powerful, it reminds me, I don't know if you remember, a couple of years ago, we did this uh, also long interview for the legacy book about Le Corbusier and your work and architecture, etc. And I remember from that one that you, like one of the trademarks that you said with your works that you want to see your fingerprints on everything that you do. There was like this very, I just remembered this when you spoke about the clay in the morning or whatever, but that you leave leave a mark on things, that they have an edge, that they yeah, feel touched and not untouched. Yeah, I mean, that's my style. I, I think it's important. Um, we live in this golden age of like perfectly made things. Again, this thing, there's no evidence that a human made it. It strives for that. And I could never make anything this perfect, um, but Apple can never make anything as, as shitty and flawed as, as this. Mm. It shows the fingerprints and the repairs. And that's kind of an, an advantage that I have over Apple. And um, I think the, uh, one of the other secrets is to look at what you've got. Um, you got to use what you got to get what you want. And I mean that in the most like um, exploitative way possible in that like if you have charisma you shouldn't be shy about it if you can draw like a motherfucker why be sh like embrace it brag about it show off your best stuff use it to go where you want to go um we're all a little different we've all got special secret powers it's just uh we don't all know how to use them and um you know use the things that feel good and amplify them and what would you say is your secret power? Oh, my secret power is, um, besides my good looks and charm, is uh, <laughs> picking great people. So I, I'm very selective about the people in my life and I'm very careful and um, about picking great people. And so my team, which, you know, Lucas, you're, Kind of like, you know, extension of that because I don't do every interview, but like we have a connection and I like you in the way you think. So even though we don't like work together in a formal capacity, I don't do lectures and meet with students very often anymore. So I, I select people that I believe share the vision and want to um, promote these values because these values are bigger than me and they're bigger than you and they're bigger than all of us. And I want to work with people that that, that, that believe in this. And by the way, that includes people at Apple. Like I love 
Apple. And I don't want to, I'm not saying that Apple should be different. It's like, it's the best thing there is of its kind. I'm just talking about like, you know, you kind of can't, com you kind of can't compare them. They just have different advantages, right? Like this thing, it's reverse. This thing, you can't hold liquid in it. <laughs> this can hold liquid. It's, I know it seems crazy, right? But I mean, they, you can use them both as hammers. <laughs> anyway. But then, actually, I'd like, uh, thank you for, for that. And I'd like to pick up on this one, like the, the choosing of the people around you or your team or like, you know, who you kind of work with or collaborate. Like, and I think that's a really a learning curve. That's one of the things that I'm trying to promote in this, uh, actually in this lecture series as well, because most of the people kind of always work in teams and in selected teams. And it's um, m maybe interesting also for us to understand, like if you could elaborate a little bit on your team structure or also what your um, biggest learnings have been in these kind of, let's say, collaborative or cooperative processes. Because it's, it's not an easy thing. Yeah, I, I prioritize people that make me feel good about myself. So um, people that are interested in what I'm doing and people from whom I can <laughs> learn so I'm pretty selfish, like uh, um, people that can teach me things, people that have more experience or talent or abilities in an area that I don't. Um, and people that express that they're actually interested in me because it's a dialogue, it's a two-way street. I describe the studio as a teaching hospital. <laughs> I might be the chief surgeon, but there's certainly some young surgeons who are up on the latest techniques that I don't know how to control. Like, I really want to do a Roblox. Does anyone in the audience program in Roblox? Does anyone program robots? Uh, shaking heads in the sense of not really. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're not, we're not um, casting a future programmer here. <laughs> I'm, looking for, I'm looking for a Roblox coder. Um, but uh, by we'll the way, put the Roblox word out. We'll put the word out. Yeah. <laughs> it's like you know, Roblox. I just I, I Google like you, you can anyone can be a Roblox coder in twenty minutes. I think it could take a lifetime to be a great one, but the basics are there. Um, yeah. So. No, yeah, I, I, I was asking about the team structure. Like how, how? Like how do you? Yeah. What What's the setup like for you? Like how many people do you have in the studio there? Like. So it's, there are about 20 of us and uh, in, in this location. Right now we're in um, my side. Uh, you can't really see that much because this is a desktop computer so I can't move it that much. And the door is closed, but this is kind of like my studio. It's also my, my old kitchen table and my old sink and microwave oven. This beautiful green. Panasonic microwave oven. Oops. <laughs> there, that one. There. Yeah. Um, and, and, but then we have collaborators that we work with in different places, like we have a foundry in Arizona, and then we work with uh, our friends in Portland, Oregon, who make our shoes for us at Nike. And um, we also have an, a rich alumni staff. So. When we do exhibitions in other parts of the world, other people who've worked here in the past but have moved on to do other things in their life, they come back to help us. They fly in for like a week or two and help here and there. But I remember, for example, when we were for the opening uh, outside of Stuttgart, when was it, two years ago? One yeah. of your um, crew members said that like the first thing that everyone has to do is actually paint that red and white, I don't know if it's just the urban legend, but that they had have to, like behind you, we see like the, the, the classical thing that you see in urban spaces when you are kind of blocking off the street, the white and red yeah. um, board, that one of the first things is that you have to paint one of those. Is this an urban legend or is this true? No, it's real. Um, it's called Con Ed boards. And um, this is like a little embarrassing, but you know, I used to steal them from the streets and make them into 
cabinets for my sculpture. And the embarrassing thing is that they stopped making them out of wood and now they're made out of plastic and I have to make them from scratch. So the embarrassing thing isn't that I stole them, that I have, has integrity. The embarrassing thing is like, I got so addicted to them that I, I'm making them from scratch now. So that's one of the sort of um, belly of the whale uh, stages to the hero's journey in the studio. And um, I think we have a lot of, uh, quite a few architecture students here in the crowd. No, can, can the architects raise their hands? Well, I'm, I'm exaggerating with quite a few, but there's, 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 a, there's a bit. And um, I remember um, that you um, have a background in architecture, actually. You studied architecture uh, both in the States as well at the AA in London, no? Yeah. Um, how did that influence your artistic practice, or did you ever want to become an architect? Well, first of all, I would say that I'm so sorry to those of you architects. I really <laughs> part goes out to you. Um, it's really the worst, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> so if you feel like quitting, I support you. Um, uh, I'm secretly still an architect, and I will build again. But um, it's, it's hard. Um, architecture has been replaced with value engineering and it's very difficult unless you're a star architect or have a rich, like building a tea house for your mom, you know, unless you have extreme privilege, it's very difficult. And um, I'm kind of not, I, I'm like not a fan of all of this um, curvy bullshit. Like, I don't understand these new buildings going up and why um, there's so much um, caprice and indulgence um, when there are so many great opportunities for light and air and space. Um, I never thought that I would be have such conservative values for architecture, but um, the more I look and the more I use buildings, the more frustrated I am. There's an increasing disregard for nature and... Um, uh, and uh, uh, and the, there's nowhere where the uh, patriarchy um, and destruction of the planet is 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 is, is, is more is, is better expressed than in contemporary architecture. Um, but I, I, it's of all of the arts, it's probably the one that's most complex and has the most potential for change because it's how we organize people. It's the art of organizing um, how people use space. So it's very important that we stick to it and try. And um, by the way, can I check another urban legend, Tom? <laughs> Is it true that you ran the model workshop for Frank Gehry before your artistic career? Um, I, I did work for Frank, but I didn't do, the model, although I worked a little bit in the model workshop, um, I worked in a different model workshop in London, but I was, I worked on the bent plywood furniture collection that he did with Noel. Ah. Um, so I worked, I was, it was on a, a three man team and I was the, uh, I was the assistant, but that was kind of my, where I did my um, apprenticeship. That's where I um, got my masters in, um, in plywood. Nice, I, I can see that connection. And then before I'm opening up, I, mean, I have a lot of more questions, but I want to throw some questions from the uh, students in here. But before that, um, uh, we mentioned the beginning, the call with Nike, now we spoke about architecture. Then again, you are, so you, there's this phenomena that you are um, highly established within the contemporary art world, um, but also within the de design world. You have a, a following, um, with the, your work that you do for Nike, for example, that is like uh, not necessarily part of your kind of artistic career. And I'm wondering how you are able to balance that or how you kind of, um, I guess, mm, have them work for each other or at the same time. Well, I, to me, there's no difference. I don't see it as balance. I don't see it as being like different than sculpture. It's all sculpture to me. Um, so whether that's a sneaker or a sculpture, like, uh, you know, that thing, that thing, that is a sculpture, or a movie, like 
10 bullets saying the movies that I've made with Van and Charlie about the values of the studio or a Nike ad. Like we did the ad for the boring ad for the sneaker and you can look that up. That was like, I, 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 that's the, that's called the devil's art, the art of advertising or ceramics, which is kind of like, you know, classified more as a craft. Um, I, you know, bring the same values to to all of these approaches. Um, I don't really care what you call it. I think it's, in a way, um, there's some words that I would like to banish from popular vocabulary. Um, the first is um, design, because design is in everything. Everything is designed. Um, a sculpture is designed, a movie is designed. Um, and when you have those words, then you kind of ghettoize the concept into a into a place where the idea is like oh well you can only do design in art or in industrial design but it's in everything um, and um, the other word i would like to eliminate from our vocabulary is creatives everyone's creative like someone said to me once hey are you an angry artist tom i was like no fuck you i'm an angry person you know i'm a happy person like don't like, don't buy any of these cliches that artists are unhappy or that they're more passionate than anyone else. Like, my lawyer, John Charles Thomas, is more creative than 75% of you in this room. And I'm just saying that in general because 75% of the people that I've met. He's a lawyer, but he has creative solutions and is a creative thinker. But his art is law. And there's no shame in that. He's a, he's a great collaborator. And I don't want to meaning insulting all of you guys. I'm just saying in general. And in the same way that you could walk into an art gallery, any art gallery in the world, the best art gallery you can think of, and walk into that room and without opening your eyes, if you were to say the art in this room sucks, you would be right 75% of the time <laughs> by your own taste standards. Because it's really only the very small percentage, maybe it's even 90% of the time that the, that the work meets St true standards of excellence. It's true. Um, I would like to open this up for you guys. Wait, did you just say it's true? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, let, let's, let's, uh, let's agree on this one. I mean, there's so many uh, uh, perspectives on this. I, I always have this when, for example, I was at the Venice Biennale, and there's, yeah. I mean, someone can go out and say, oh, this is amazing, this was such an inspiring show. And then for me, it was like, hmm, okay, but I don't know, that's, that's the great thing about art. But at this moment, for you guys, I, I have a whole long list of questions here still for Tom. But I, would, I would rather, you know, Lucas, I would rather, I know that you're probably getting stressed out that we're not going to have time to get through all the questions. No, no, easy. I would rather, like, you know, focus on the answers, because I think some of the bigger, it's not always important that we get to every but yeah, let's let's try. No, no. Again, we can skip my questions. I'm asking now the students to speak if there's oh. already at this point uh, questions from you guys. For Tom. Sorry, yes, sorry, there's, sorry. there's one uh, hand raised. Speak up very loud. I think that Tom will understand you. Otherwise, I will kind of say it again. What did you make to study architecture? Um, what was the purpose that you started to study in architecture? He, uh, I don't know if you heard it, but he asked why in the first place did you even study architecture? Well, I think it was what I was saying before. I, I think it's it's the ultimate art. Uh, as far as artistic practices go, it's the place where the most is at stake. I mean, if you don't like my sculpture, you can just leave the art gallery. But it, if you don't like my architecture, but it's a it's a bank, and you got to go in there to get your money. You got to suffer through it, unless you're into web three and crypto and you don't need to use a bank at all. That's another <laughs> solution. I, I think it's, it, 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 it's one of, literally one of the most complex things that en encompasses all the other arts. And it's important that we have got great architects and great architecture. So I, I think I, I was trying to do that until I got so frustrated with the process that I said, fuck it, I don't care about humanity. I'm just gonna have a good time. But I, I can't help myself. So we'll probably go back to it more and more. There's another question from the audience. And, then, and, then, and that's what we're doing in a lot of ways with our shoes, because it's a, a, a shoe is a, is a piece of architecture that connects your body with the ground. True. I'm kind of curious about this topic of sleep. Like, I think uh, you have a like, tight schedule, but how does he manage to fit in? Like, 
Yeah. Uh, it's a very good question. Um, he was asking you, uh, he's coming back to the topic of sleep. You mentioned that you have eight hours of sleep. How, how he's, he is asking you, how, how do you prioritize sleep in your probably very busy daily schedule? I, um, and there's, there's a triangle that you cannot escape. It's, we call it the health triangle, and it's diet, rest, and exercise. Um, you cannot escape. You will get sick if you eat bad food. You will have physical health issues if you do not exercise. And if you exercise too much without resting, you'll be burned out and you won't be able to think. The, the another dimension, another reality is, is our subconscious mind when we're sleeping. It's the only place where the surreal state prevails. And it's a place where our minds make sense through the nonsensical state of dreamscape of our lives. I mean, some cultures believe that the dream state is the real state and that our waking hours are the, um, this place where we have our jobs and we work so that we can support ourselves so that we can eat and survive and so that we can sleep and that our real life is in our dreams. Now, I'm not saying one or the other, but there's no doubt if you're not well rested, you can't think. And people always ask me, where do I get my ideas? Or what made you think of that or something? And I, can, I can't always answer that, but I know that if I'm well rested, I have better ideas. And that if I'm tired, that my mind is linear and reptilian and more close to fight or flight. And when you're fighting or flighting, you're not creating because you've got to take care of your basic survival needs. Art is at a really high level of experience. This is like a rarefied thing. You can only do this after you've taken care of air and shelter and water and food and sex and, and love. You know, without those basic needs, you're, it's very hard to create. I'm not saying you can't do it, but it's a lot easier if you're rested. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have another question here. So, by the way, like, yeah. don't think that if you work out five, seven days a week and you're all jacked and you're not resting and eating, that you're going to make it. You're going to get injured. You're going to be tired and burned out. Like, there's no escape. And this is, like, kind of bitter medicine to take t for the ambitious because like you want to do it all mm -hmm. but rest is king in fact I, I like i do a lot of workouts when i say a lot of workouts i work out 2.25 times a week on average and a lot of the time with traveling and how busy i am i have to forego a workout because i have to get rest or i'll try and work out without rest and then like i get too tired and i gotta rest more or i'm injured and then i'm out of it for five days so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's really one of the hardest disciplines. And the other thing that's really hard is like not doing so many push-ups, like doing them every day, but not killing yourself, which is hard because the workout culture and athletic culture, when you look at all the advertising around us, only supports things like boot camp and Navy SEALs and like being professional. Like I'm an athlete because I have a body, but I'm not an elite athlete and I have friends who are elite athletes and you know what they don't do? Ceramics. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Thank you. Speaking of ceramics, Greg, you have a, a question uh -huh. too. So it's kind of like a continuation of like Luca's last question. Um, you work like across sculpture, like to like a fine art level that shows in like high end galleries to like, fashion, to set designs, to ceramic objects, to furniture. Um, I guess my question is like, when I've been working recently with galleries and stuff, some of them like aren't interested in me if I'm selling like objects for like hundreds of euros because they want to sell works for thousands of euros, for example. But you have like stuff that goes across that whole range from like thousands, tens of thousands to like, you know, more accessible objects. So. How do you approach that with galleries or suppliers or sellers? And was it always like that? Or was there a point when you were like, okay, right now I'm just focusing on high-end sculptures that sell for whatever, thousands of euros, thousands of dollars. 
and then after that you were like, okay, now I'm established, I have the opportunity to do those more fun objects and have them more accessible to other people and, and put them out through different... Um, I hear you. So I, I always, my answer to that is do it all. But be realistic about your partner. So I had a, this is a little, I, I my, my first art dealer, Paul Morris, um, who I, I did a, a couple of shows with him in Chelsea when Chelsea was first starting out, the, the area of New York City that has all the art galleries now. Um, and it was a little different than, than the question you're asking, but he said, I, I, I had like three different kinds of work. Some of it was like really easy to sell and some of it was really hard to sell. And he said to me, Tom, I'm not gonna tell you what kind of art you should make, but it, if you wanna make money with me, I can only sell these easy to sell paintings. Those difficult sculptures, I can't sell those. And I'm not saying what you should do with your time because it's your life but I can only sell those easy to sell paintings. So, and he was such a dick about it. Um, but in a sense, I really respect it in, in retrospect because he was honest about his abilities and shortcomings and what he was willing to do with his time. So I made, in the end I did both and he sold the things that he said he could sell and he didn't sell the things that he said he couldn't sell. And, um, you know, I, I've been I've been lucky that I've been able to do both, but I've always made things for ten dollars. I've had my web store right now, which is huge. It's a giant part of my effort. Um, um, I've been it's been going for seventeen years, and I there were now every day there are many orders every day, but there were times when there were like two orders a week, and I always I did it myself using um, the internet as soon as that the computers could support it. And it was a huge pain in the ass. I would like package the things myself and then I get assistance to do it. And now a fulfillment center in Los Angeles that specializes in shipping out goods and we do higher, higher volume and I'm spending a lot of time on that. Um, but I think you have to be realistic about who your partners are. Like if your gallery is like wants to sell something for a thousand dollars and you want to sell it for a hundred, like I would, in my view, I would sell the thousand dollar thing through them and then sell the hundred dollar thing through some other method. Like, because in the end, to me, there's no difference between painting that costs as much as like a car and a pen dollar item, like a pen or a sticker or a zine or something. They all have the same ethos. They're just more expensive to produce, more elaborate to sell, something that as much as a car and you need hand holding something that costs as much as a sandwich doesn't require any human interaction mm -hmm. to sell it and i think you got to kind of be honest with yourself about the situation and opportunity that's in front of you and make the most of it mm, sweet another question have fun uh, maybe all the scenes and, and and further to that you got to fuck with the dick you got you can't make something other than it is. You gotta, you gotta work with the opportunity as it is. You can change it 5%, 20% if you're a genius, but not 100% ever. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question, Hassan, speak up very loud because then Tom can maybe hear it. Yeah, um, just like because of the zines, when did you, like, why did you start making these handmade zines and it is still fun? Yeah. Well, I've, I've made zines since I was in high school and um, I would you know, give them away to other people in my community as a way of sharing my vision. And the ones I made in high school, I made 12 copies because I had 12 friends that I thought would care. And one of those copies got pinned up on the bulletin board of school and would stay up there for three or four days before someone would tear it down. And that was, a, that was my audience. 12 people or maybe a few hundred people if they look, depending on how, who actually walked by. And then I've always made zines as a way of memorializing my, all my art shows. Not always, but since like 98, I've made a zine for every show that I've been in. 
And um, it's because I put so much energy into these exhibitions, but then they're out for a month and then they're gone. I wanted to make something that would last. And I've always loved doing it. And I never see it as a burden. However, a lot of that um, intent has been replaced by Instagram and YouTube. Like a lot of the movies that I've made have replaced the urge to make zines. So in a way it's a little more challenging because Instagram is the superior um, medium to zine making, but I'm nostalgic and I'm a sensualist and I love paper and I love handmade things that you can touch. And I like the speed of which the data is conveyed um, on paper more than on a screen because I'm old. Um, and I know that some of the people in this room agree with me, um, not about being, me being old, but about the sensuality of the touch. And uh, so I, I would, in fact, I think I'm gonna do a little zine seminar um, with some high school kids um, because um, at Brooklyn Museum, because what's really great about teach, and I would encourage anyone who's a teacher to teach the zine making class, because what's really cool about the zine making class is, and I know Pat McCarthy teaches zine making too, is you you make it enough copies for everyone in the class. So at the end of the class, everyone in the class has a zine collection. And that's just like a, it's like a fun, it's a, it's a fun and rewarding model. You can teach whatever you want in the class, but that's always like kind of the only rule that I go by. So everyone, including myself, um, makes enough zines for everyone in the class. Nice, thanks. Yeah. Another question, yeah, there's another question, actually two, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, you seem to have a lot of certainties that guide you through your work, um, which they come from making questions all the time. And so, sort of, what are your uncertainties right now? Did you hear that? No. <laughs> um, what are your, uh, um, so it started um, uh, with, um, um, uh, repeat that again, with. That it seems that you have a lot of certainties. You have a lot of certainties, um, but what are your uncertainties right now? It's a nice question, by the way. Yeah. I feel like I have more uncertainties than certainties. I think the certainties I don't even think about, right? They're just, I don't, it's like, it's like I'm, it's like you're almost challenging me to be more, have more gratitude. <laughs> I, I think that I'm, un, I'm, an un, an un, I'm an ungrateful person. Um, uh, uncertainty is the magic. Uncertainty is where the magic lies. An artist's best work lies just beyond his ability to understand it. And only through execution does that uncertainty become concrete, become, become certain or becomes represented in a concrete form as a finished work of art. Yeah, it makes sense. And um, so, there was but, another. But, but like specifically, what's uncertain, you know, like, you know. I don't know how my Web3 Moniverse is going to really turn out because I don't understand enough about like its capabilities and more importantly, the capabilities of people on their phones using it. So I know how I want it to look. I just don't know how it's going to look. I don't know how, like, I know about my last works and how to make them, but I already made them. So like, I don't care about them anymore because the, the idea has been confined from the endless abyss and defined into what is it? Oh, it's a painting. And then it's, then it's just, then I paint it. And then in a way that the need, the desire is destroyed. So confined, defined, and then destroyed, it's gone. And I'm on to the next thing. If I'm to, if I'm to do something where there's certainty, I'm kind of repeating my past actions and I don't, it's not important. And I, and, and, you know, I have to repeat my past actions because you have to always do your push-ups. You have to build incrementally in the last thing. So it's important that you always repeat yourself a little bit so that you have some connection, but not for money, but for the roots so that your ideas are strong and have, yeah, roots. Roots is the best, yeah. Hmm. Okay, question from the audience. 
Um, so as you work with a lot of different brands or you refer to some different brands, for instance, the shoe with Nike or um, the rockets that you, like the rocket project that you did, um, why do you do that? Like why do you re refer to brands or work with specific brands um, instead of making your own shoe, for instance? Did you hear that? Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, well, I believe that uh, consumerism is is our collective religion. That although you guys are in Berlin, you guys are like so fucking cool. <laughs> I've never seen people more resistant to this idea and proving it every day with no brands on their clothes. But the rest of us who aren't living in Berlin, who aren't as courageous, who haven't who haven't just like accepted the truth of Berlin are surrounded by people who are fashion obsessed. And I grew up in a household like this. And I, for many years, cut all of the logos off of my clothes. And even our family car, we had a Plymouth station wagon. I remember my dad was so mad when I popped all the logos off of the car. And, and he's like, why did you do that? And he said, I said, Plymouth isn't paying us to drive their car. Like, show me the royalty, show me the sponsorship check, and I'll put them back on. I'll play Pim Plymouth on the side if I'm getting paid. And he, that didn't work on him. But I was right. It didn't work because it was like, that's not the culture that I come from. So when with the Rocket Factory, all the brands are the brands of my life. You know, whether it's Chanel or... Budweiser or like Hello Kitty um, or Apple, these are the brands that I consume. And they're a it's a celebration of my life as a guilty, cons guilty yet critical consumer. But I would argue um, that I have created my own brand. 10 Bullets is the brand of the studio, which has the values of the studio, is my own brand. And even with Nike, Nike Craft, is a brand that I created myself and pitched to Nike. He said, hey, I want to do this brand with you. It's called Nike Craft. It's something that's half Nike, half Tom, something that neither could do without each other. And um, that's what we're doing today. And, and by the way, I would also argue that all of us have our own brand through our Instagram channel. It's not really how we really, it's not how we really are but it's how we choose to represent ourselves to the world. Like if you go to a factory, any factory that makes something that you know, the reality of that factory is very different from their advertising. Um, but it's, their advertising is how they present themselves to the world. And we now have the world's most powerful advertising platform 100% for free through social media. And how many, by the way, how many people have Instagram pages in this room. Can raise hands? I think everyone a bit more or less. Yeah, so like you might think that you don't have a brand, but you do. Mm. Even if it's private. Mm. But I was thinking if I can pick up on your question about brands and consumerism in many ways, like your entire artistic oeuvre is in one day, one way critically yet playfully playing with all these icons of consumerism slash of modernity. And they go very hand in hand, let's say historically speaking, whether it's uh, now um, NASA or whether it's McDonald's or um, whether it's the Chanel on the rocket, um, they all, they all, like the entire work plays with these icons of um, um, modernity and consumerism but by kind of remaking them, by, by making them basically imperfect in one way or another, or uh, customizing them in a DIY way. Is that correct? Well, yeah, I mean, you can't be a, a real critic without being indoctrinated into the culture. Like, you've got to be part of it to talk about it. I'm, like, I'm, I'm part of the church. Um, and there are parts of it that I love. Like, I love... Um, how some clothes make my wife look, right? Like sh when she's all done up in Chanel, it's gorgeous. Um, I hate that she feels that she needs to wear these clothes to feel good about herself. 
but I like that she dresses up and does a presentation. I mean, fashion is a art like anything else, and the way she presents herself is a beautiful thing to behold. Um, you know, the advertising promises um, uh, that your life will be happy if you have this product. I think that's immoral and should be legal. But advertising also tells a story. It's a great art form. Like I've been moved by uh, Steve Jobs' Here's to the Misfits, Here's to the Crazy Ones. That you know, it's about selling Apple computers. It's total bullshit storytelling, but it will bring you to tears when you see Muhammad Ali and Gandhi. Just a picture of Al Albert Einstein's face with the right music can bring you to tears. That's art. And what would you say now um, is, what would you say is the red thread in all of your works? And like, why do you do what you do? The what? The What's the red thread throughout all of red your works? Thread. Yeah. And like, basically, why do you do what you do? I mean, I think there are kind of two reasons. Like. One is to educate and entertain myself, indulge my, my uh, athletic ability of making things with my hands because I enjoy the sensuality of it. But that kind of doesn't mean anything without um, uh, spiritual um, uh, objective. And I, I think for me, it goes back to architecture and wanting the world to be a more transparent and just place. Um, where people build a greater connection with their things. Because I'm essentially a thing maker. So I, I want to make sure that the things that I make have lasting quality, both physically and emotionally, so that people have a greater connection with their things in their lives. Um, so they don't always need to get a new sneaker. Like, you wear the sneakers you got, wear them to death, clean them, By the way, you can throw any pair of sneakers in a washing machine, just don't throw them in the dryer and they'll, they'll be clean. And when the sole wears out, almost any pair of sneakers, you can glue a new piece of rubber on the bottom and wear it again. And then you have a greater connection with your thing. You have a greater connection, and that can represent a greater connection to your, to your community, to your body, to your planet. And um, would you say that This is kind of why you do what you do. What, what would you say is kind of the, the still this kind of red line, the red thread that runs through a weave through all of your different works? Well, I, I, didn't I just say it? <laughs> There, let, let's let's take it. it. It felt like this is like why you do what you do. Like it's almost like this is like what you like what you're here for. But there's. But we can skip that then. Fine, we take that as an answer. No, but, 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 but I mean, if, if you want to hear it in a different way, I would say it's the music of the African diaspora that drives me. You know, that's the art that I, inspires me. The, the, um, that's kind of like what, like, turn, that's what I feel is the, you know, is the, is the energy that, that makes me, um, when I don't know, that, that I consume. In a, in, a, in a spiritual sense, or else maybe it's just like, yeah, just the, the, the showing up. Like I love the ritual. The, the ritual showing up every day at work is, is my religion. Actually, this might make me think of um, this amazing toolbox that you bring to every exhibition. Like they would, it's kind of an exhibition piece, but it's also your toolbox. And each tool had a different name, and that seemed to me like this is yours, like source of inspiration. There was a hammer, I, I forgot, it was maybe Muhammad Ali, and there was, a, a, I don't know, a nail. There was Jack Kerouac, I don't know, but it, it seemed like it was the tools that you actually use for your practice, but it was also the inspirations or the homage that you 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 give. Yes, those are those are my people. Yeah. Like if I were to say, you know, who are you, Tom? Like besides me, it's like all the people that came before me. Yeah. So if I read like my read like three of Maya Angelou's biographies, I haven't gotten through all of them yet, but like she's inspired me tremendously, or the people that you just named, and these are the people that make up who I am, or Mother Anne Lee. 
And then coming now um, um, also to the end of our talk here, Tom, I really appreciate that you take your uh, time in, uh, in a very busy uh, working day. It's a question that I'm asking every speaker here, and that's regarding advice. Um, so um, as I told you, we have maybe like 50, 60 uh, students from very different backgrounds here. What, like, what piece of advice could you give all of these becoming artists, designers, architects, um, etc.? You know, I'm going to kind of repeat it, and it is from the book of Steve. Um, the, make sure you love what you do, um, because the key to success is showing up. And there are going to be many days you don't want to show up, but you're going to anyway because you love what you do. And if you don't love what you do, give up immediately and do something else. And if you're struggling with not knowing what that thing is to do, keep looking till you find something that you like to do a little bit. <laughs> And then, and then keep doing that and do it until it's not fun and then try something else that you like to do a little bit more. You'll find it. But, but like, indulge, indulge yourself, make it really fun. That's why I quit architecture to do sculpture because I like doing sculpture more, a lot more. I liked that, but you know, there's always some sculpt, some architecture stuff in it a little bit because I like that too. But. I, and I've been, I've been really lucky, but I've also been really disciplined with indulging my desires for what I want to make. And so must you. Sweet. Tom, thank you so much, you know, for, for, for this, for taking your time. It's been great, um, worthwhile waiting and having beers before the talk. <laughs> um, please send my love to your whole studio. For sure. And I, I, hope, to, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you so much. And Thanks guys, guys thanks a warm applause listening. from Berlin here. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> and thank you for all your questions. I hope that I, I know you, you guys didn't answer after my answer, but I, but I hope uh, that uh, that was helpful. It thanks was. It was the best uh, season finish, the season end that I could imagine. Thank you so much for this. Take Bye. care. Bye bye. Sweet. And thank you all um, for showing up today for this talk. I hope you enjoyed it. I jo enjoyed it a lot, and I think it was uh, worth. Um, it is dope, no? <laughs> it's a good effect. Uh, it was uh, worth waiting for. And I would like to thank you all at this point for actually um, being part of this uh, lecture series. Uh, I hope you. Um, took something um, for your own artistic practice or development home with you, something that kind of inspires you kind of to think a little bit uh, across the, you know, uh, the borderlines of your own discipline. I also, um, I don't know who of you wants to get a, um, credits for this, but you can send in the stuff also later, that's not a problem, you also have a question about that. But anyways, you can send everything to me later, that's no, no, no biggie. I added one more task, and that is really important to me, and I would really, really appreciate it. It's just feedback on the course. So basically, since last semester, I'm piloting these various uh, transdisciplinary formats here at the UDK to see uh, what the need for that is and, um, and how it kind of is being received. So there's an extra question. If you go on Moodle, it's like, please share your, um, I don't know, comments, feedback, uh, um, thoughts on uh, this lecture series. I don't know, about the selection of the speakers, how it went, what was the atmosphere like, what you took home. Just a few sentences, but I, it would mean the world to me, because I, I want to learn kind of and make it better on the one hand. On the other hand, it's uh, from a very pragmatic point of view, I need to communicate this also to the higher ups within the system to make them aware this is really, I believe it's very needed to, to offer these platforms. And as I said, that's really inspired from you guys. Um, it's continuing anyways for the next two semesters. But next semester, it's going to be a mixed seminar lecture series. So we're going to have the same amount of lectures, but we'll meet weekly. And then always the other week, we actually do exercises together so that we, actually, we can work together. Because now it's, it's, I don't know, I like the vibe. There's a crowd somehow. There's a team feeling, yet we don't really know each other. We haven't worked together. And that's going to be different for the next semester. Anything important that I forgot, Philippe Leon? Nee. Then a big thank you to the entire 
Studium Generale Team, who is making this, um, Jakob, Philippe, and uh, Leon, and Katrin, and Flora, who are all making this possible, and good luck with the Rundgang. I'm sure I'm going to see you around and have a, an amazing semester break, and hope to see you then in the winter semester again. Thank you.